Hello and welcome to Carbon Expo 2022. My name is Kat Galloway. I'm the CEO of Artemis Energy based out of Austin, Texas. I'd like to thank Dwayne Purvis and the team for inviting me to talk with you today. I'm going to talk specifically about flared gas to Bitcoin mining. We're going to talk about um, the concepts. We're going to look at emissions reductions, potentials from these projects, and a little bit of a how-to at the end. So again, thank you for joining me. I'll be here this afternoon to go through live questions as you have them. So first, let me share my screen. Here we go. So a little bit of background about myself. Um, again, my name is Kat Galloway. I've got about 20 years of experience, particularly in environmental and air permitting. My background has been helping people understand, quantify, measure, describe air emissions throughout their process. I've been doing this for about 20 years. Um, I've got about a decade of experience, specifically in oil and gas, um, in the upstream and midstream sectors. I started Artemis Energy last year as a way to help bring Bitcoin mining to the industry, to the oil and gas industry, also to reduce emissions from those sectors. So let's start with flaring. What is flaring? Um, you may see a lot of flares out in the Houston Ship Channel or out in the oil and gas um, area. Um, flaring is a very important part of the oil and gas process. So essentially, if you have gas that would be otherwise vented to the atmosphere, instead of venting those hydrocarbons to the atmosphere, a flare destroys it. It combusts it. It burns up those hydrocarbons. Um, and so what, what happens in the combustion process is that we have some hydrocarbons. They're going to combine with the oxygen in the air, and then our products are going to be CO2 and water. Now, for flaring, we typically assume that a flare will destroy about 98% of whatever hydrocarbons it are being fed into the flare. That's not always the case. It can be much lower, especially if you have problems with the flare, with the flame itself. Um, but a general kind of industry average is that it's 98%. The emissions that we have from a flare are lower than it would be if it was vented, but we are, through the combustion process, we are creating some additional types of pollutants. The emissions that we are very interested in from a regulatory and public health standpoint are what's called the criteria pollutants. Those are regulated by the EPA. So we're interested in NOx, carbon monoxide, SO2, in particulate matter. We're also looking at whatever hydrocarbons have not been destroyed in that flare. And also we have emissions of CO2, carbon emissions. Now in the oil field, there are lots of different places that you could have flaring and not all flared gas is the same. And I wanted to point this out because you hear about Bitcoin mining off of flared gas, but we really need to ask where is that flared gas coming from? So in, in my experience, what I've done here is I've shown the different sources of flared gas. A lot of times we're going to hear about production gas, which is the associated gas that's coming up from the well along with the oil and the water. Um, and this is typically a pretty high flow of gas, but over time you're going to see a decline in those flows typically. Um, and typically that gas is, is, you know, a natural gas kind of nice BTUs as, as a heat content. Another source of gas can be um, the tank vapors themselves. So in your storage tank, you are creating um, vapors. And those are heavier vapors because they're coming right off of the oil. So that's more in like the 2500 BTU range. And that can be steady and it can be a medium to high flow. Another type of flaring is whenever an oil site has some maintenance activities where you are, you know, opening up pieces of equipment to clean them or you're you're blowing down a piece of equipment or you're con conducting some pigging operations. Those types of emissions are going to be very intermittent flow. They're going to happen when they're going to happen and then they're going to be done. 
So you've really got um, intermittent flow, and it, depending on what exactly that maintenance event is, the heat content could be across the board. We've also got instances where we've got dehydrator or amine gas, if we're doing some gas treatment. Um, those types of flows are typically pretty low flow, but steady. Typically, they're very low BTU content, so not very combustible. And of course, we've got emergencies and you know, you can't really predict what those emissions are going to be, but it could be a source of flaring. So in general, when we're talking about doing Bitcoin mining at an oil and gas site, what we're going to do is, in this example, we've got oil and water and gas coming from the well, going through your separation. Um, the liquids are going to drop into your tanks, and then you've got gas coming off the tanks. Um, you've also got your associated gas. So at an oil and gas site, if you took all of these gas streams, a very common practice would be to flare it. But in a Bitcoin mine, instead of flaring it, we're going to take that gas and we're going to put it into some sort of natural gas engine or turbine, and we're going to create electricity instead. And that electricity will then be used on site to power the Bitcoin data center. So broad concepts here. If we're taking this gas and instead of flaring it, we're going to put it into an engine instead. What we've got is instead of wasting that gas, lighting it on fire, sending it out of flare, we are capturing that gas and we're going to use it. So that is a really important energy efficiency project. We're not wasting that energy. We have the potential to reduce or even eliminate flaring in the oil field outright. And what happens is that when we have this gas now going to power your Bitcoin data center, that gas, it, that gas is no longer a waste, it is an asset. So what I'm going to do is I've been working on understanding the true emissions from um, running a Bitcoin mine versus flaring. So I've done a scenario here. I've done some calculations. I've recently presented this in a white paper that I've um, I've issued on the website um, for uh, for Bright Sky Environmental, and I've discussed the differences in emissions from if we were to either take gas and put it into a flare. That's my scenario number one. The second option, instead of flaring it, let's take those emissions and put it into a microturbine and do Bitcoin mining with it instead. And through these calculations, I've made some pretty interesting uh, findings here that we can reduce VOC emissions by like 98%. That's pretty significant. Um, we're reducing carbon monoxide by 69%. We can reduce NOx by over 40%. And also of particular interest to this carbon expo is that we can actually reduce our greenhouse gas emissions from flaring by putting it into a Bitcoin mine instead. So let me show you exactly what we've done. So for the first scenario, my scenario here is that we've got 170 MSCUF per day of gas and we're gonna send it to a flare. OK, um, using EPA standard calculation methodology and a gas composition for a typical midstream gas um, facility. Here you can see what our total emissions are. So we've got about nine tons of VOC. We've got two tons of NOx from combustion. We've got CO from combustion. Um, and then we've also created CO2 and we also have undestroyed methane, which as you know, is 25 times more powerful greenhouse gas than CO2. So the post-control methane is also very important. So um, we've calculated about 3,500 metric tons a year of CO2. So now take that gas and instead of sending it to a flare, let's send it to a capstone microturbine. I chose a capstone microturbine because I really like the emissions, the, uh, the emissions guarantees on this unit. So again, using EPA standard methodology, 8760 hours, our emissions from the turbines are one ton per year of NOx, two ton per year of CO, 
0.2 tons of VOC and our total greenhouse gas in the form of CO2 equivalents is about 2,500 tons. So if we look at that visually, um, what I have here is the red emissions would be the emissions from if we were to flare that gas. We're looking at criteria pollutant in particular. Um, let's let's look at VOC, NOx, and CO, um, and then compare those to what it would be if we Bitcoined it instead. And I like to use Bitcoin as a verb. So as we can see, great reduction in VOC, good reduction in NOx, and a really good reduction in CO just by taking the same gas and putting it somewhere else other than a flare. We look at the same numbers for greenhouse gas. Again, we've got emissions from our flare and then emissions from Bitcoining it. So we've got about a 30% reduction in carbon emissions, um, which I think is pretty amazing. So my findings here are that if we can take this waste gas that would be going to a flare and instead put it in an engine or a turbine. You've got to choose a, a clean one, a good one. We can significantly reduce emissions of criteria pollutants, VOCs, and greenhouse gas. Um, I really consider this to be a pollution abatement option, right? If you're flaring gas and you want to reduce your emissions, let's put it in an engine and Bitcoin it. Um, these emissions reductions are real, they are credible, they can be tracked, they can be monitored, you can do a before and after. So this is a great emissions reduction strategy for the oil field. And I really believe that for Bitcoin mining itself, if we can take this gas that would be wasted and instead capture it and use it um, to power something else, it's also an energy efficiency project because we're not, we're no longer wasting that gas. So how do you do it? Okay, so there, there are several different scenarios that I've seen so far in, in how um, Bitcoin mining is happening out in the oil field, okay? I've been looking at this, I'm working projects on it, and um, the way that I set up this slide, if we start from the left-hand side, we're moving from lower risk to high risk as we move across this chart. So, Typically, um, kind of the, the lowest risk type option, if you're an operator, would be for a Bitcoin miner to just buy your gas. Okay, so instead of flaring it, you're going to sell it to a Bitcoin miner. In order to do that, um, there's got to be a gas purchase agreement in place. Consider that you're not going to make a lot of money off of that gas because um, for Bitcoin mining, really the key for the miners is getting the cheapest energy possible. So if you have cheap energy, we're gonna do that over, for example, doing something on grid. So don't expect a lot of money for that gas, but you will get some money. And, and the concept here is that the Bitcoiner is going to own and operate all of the equipment, have it on your site, lease the land, operate it, all on site. The Bitcoiner is going to make all of the profits from uh, that Bitcoin. So it's kind of the the, the least risk, uh, least risky option for an operator. Kind of moving up the spectrum. The next idea is to go into a Bitcoiner and an operator joint venture. Um, in that scenario, there would be a split of the investment money uh, to start off the project, and you probably wouldn't have a gas purchase, although you know you certainly could. And in this situation, um, the owner of the site, as well as the Bitcoiner, are going to have some sort of arrangement for the equity in that Bitcoin. Um, and, and what's really exciting about all of these projects is that they are so new, right? So if you have a concept in mind for how you want to structure that joint venture, you know, there's no set in stone. Everything is up for negotiation. And then kind of the final scenario that I've seen is where the operator itself, you know, decides that, that, that they want to do the Bitcoin mining themselves, do it totally vertical. So in that case, the operator is uh, the Bitcoin miner, right? So they own the well, they own all the liquids and gas, and they own the Bitcoin um, equipment that's there on site. In that case, you really got to consider 
if you're looking at your capital expenditures um, with oil price being what it is, do you want to drill more wells or do you want to get into the Bitcoin business? So th that's important to think about as you're looking at your capital allocations. So in order to develop a good Bitcoin project, there are lots of different moving parts that you've got to consider. Um, and if you think about it from a project development, there's kind of four main buckets of things that we need to consider, all right? So the first one is the gas itself. Where are you going to get that gas, okay? You need to have a steady flow of gas. And the reason for that is when you're creating Bitcoin, you can't get one minute into a Bitcoin calculation and then lose power, right? You've got to have steady power to keep those um, keep those computers running. Um, kind of the, the minimum flow that is required to really set up a little tiny baby Bitcoin mine is to have at least 15 MCF per day. But the more gas you have, the more power you're going to create. So you've got to have clean, steady gas. It needs to be sweet. Um, as we get into sour gas, high H2S, um, you're going to have air emissions you're going to have to deal with. So you're going to have high H2S, high SO2 emissions, and also um, that, that H2S is going to eat up all of your engines. So if you can, avoid, uh, avoid really sour gas. Um, the gas also needs to be combustible. So it needs to have enough BTUs that it's going to create combustion in that engine. If it's too heavy, too rich, you might have to have some, some intermediate steps to remove some of the heavier gases in there. But that'll be up to discussion with you and your engine manufacturers. Um, you really got to have clean burning natural gas generators or turbines. And when I say clean burning, what I mean is that, you know, in, in the oil field, we're used to engine maintenance and permitting engines and what the emission guarantees are for your NOx, your VOC, et cetera. As an industry, I really hope that Bitcoin can keep some good emissions, some clean burning engines out there for this industry, because if not, um, the radar is really going to be focusing focusing in on the bad emissions coming from Bitcoin mining. So let's let's keep them good, keep them clean. You've also got to look at transformers. Um, the ASICs themselves are um, going to need their own transformers. So make sure that you've got some good people on your power. Um, now the ASICs, these are the um, the computers that are processing calculations and that are um, creating the Bitcoin itself. So there are lots of ASICs out there. There are lots of distributors. They're coming from all over the globe. Um, there are a lot of them in Texas. Um, so really what I, what I want to bring home to you is that you have a trusted network of suppliers. Um, make sure you've got good, um, you know, good trusted people who can help get you that equipment. Because the bulk of the capital cost for a Bitcoin project is going to be the ASICs. Those ASICs need to have somewhere safe to live, um, and those are in in huts. Okay, so they a, a hut is a um, it's a portable um, storage unit, right? Think think of a shipping container, and the idea is that. You know, it can live at the oil and gas site with a very small footprint. Um, if you have enough room, perhaps you could build a warehouse um, that would be cheaper. But a lot of these sites, you don't have a huge room to build a warehouse. So, so everything is coming containerized. Um, a lot of the initial projects that, that have been developed in the Bitcoin space were done in colder climates like the Bakken um, computers don't like to get hot. Um, and so those those initial projects in the cooler weather were really great because you could capture that heat and do something else with it. But we're seeing a lot of projects now coming into the south, coming into Texas. Um, and so you we've really got to consider cooling options for those units because we don't want them to get too hot and overheat and do bad things.
a couple of other logistics considerations. So if you're developing these projects, you will see that there can be a long lead time on equipment for these projects, and we're talking several months. Um, right now, what I'm seeing is that the ASICs can come pretty quickly, but you may have a, a, a lag time on the containers themselves or on the power generation equipment. Um, one thing that people are often very surprised about is that actually the air permitting for these sites can be the long pole in the tent um, on the project timeline. So you've got to make sure that you consider air permitting in all these projects because it can be the make it or break it on your timeline. And part of that is understanding what your emissions are from your power generation and how you can reduce those emissions as low as possible to get a permit as quickly as possible. I'm also hearing a lot of people wanting to do huge projects, you know, like 100 megawatt type sites. And if you're doing that on natural gas engines, that's going to take a long time for an air permit. Um, it, a good rule of thumb is that the, the larger the site, the more emissions you have at the site, the longer it's going to take to get that air permit, and it gets more complicated. So I'm really a fan of distributed energy as, a, as opposed to a single large source. So you've got to consider that in your project planning. A couple of other things that you need to know. Um, you need to have telecommunications, right? So the Bitcoin itself has got to have an internet signal to get out and process. Um, so you've got, you can't be out in the total middle of nowhere with no cell phone signal. You need to have some basic cell phone communications. Again, as I mentioned, um, hot weather and dust can be a big problem for these machines. So you've got to build that into your analysis when you're looking at siting as well as equipment. Remote locations, not only because of their telecommunications, but just getting there um, can be difficult. So once the, once the power generation and the ASICs and the HUTs are all set up, there shouldn't be too much that needs to go on with the ASICs, right? We're not going to be driving out there a lot. Most of what's going on can be done remotely through the internet. But when you have engine problems, you've got to be able to have someone go out there and fix the engine, right? Um, and you may need someone to be able to go out and unplug and plug in the, the computers. So, a lot of times you'll see that you might get a surcharge if um, your maintenance, if you have a maintenance technician um, who can't get out there very quickly. So, you know, just keep that in mind. Um, also, for remote locations, if we're talking, you know, several feet of snow during the winter, that can be a problem too. So there's all sorts of things to think about. Um, Another important problem is, is security and access. So you've got a containerized box out there, you know, with $5 million worth of computers, right? So you need to make sure that, that you've got it properly um, quarantined off so you can't just have people showing up there and potentially doing bad things at the site. Uh, so you've really got to uh, build in some good security and access into your project. I mentioned ASIC monitoring and optimization. Someone's got to be looking at uh, the actual Bitcoin production and what's going on. So you can have someone on your team or you can contract it out um, to some, some Bitcoin mining experts who can help keep everything running, keep everything going at the right power that you need. And even though we're talking about reducing flaring and eliminating flaring, I want to point out that you do need to keep the flare there for emergencies, right? So you've still got to have that option. So these projects really depend on the size, the amount of gas that you've got. Um, so from a financial consideration, a little small project could be a hundred grand, um, but you know, once you get into a megawatt and more, you're talking multi-million dollar projects, okay? Um, pricing on the computers, changes daily and I hate it. It's hard to find um, price listing for all the all the ASICs out there um, because the ASIC producers want to make as much money as they can. So the prices are going to fluctuate with uh, cryptocurrency prices. So I hate that, but that that's what it is. 
as far as who's funding these projects, I've seen a really good appetite out there for PE firms and individual investors. Um, there, there is some traditional banking that's out there, but I feel like the um, the private equity money, you know, um, is is more interested in the oil and gas area right now. So on these projects, they're very capital intensive upfront. Uh, so you've got to have money to buy all the equipment. And once you have all the equipment and you set it out there, you turn it on, you're making money immediately, which is exciting. Um, what I'm seeing is that for these projects, you know, it might have a payoff period of two to three years. So keep that in mind. We also can't predict the future on what the Bitcoin prices are going to be, but um, you can, you're going to have to make some assumptions. You've got to be, be comfortable with having a Bitcoin wa wallet because you're going to be generating Bitcoin and you're going to have to have Bitcoin conversion to U.S. dollars to keep your project running. So you've got to get up to speed on that. One, one thing that I found was interesting is that in order to run any sort of business, you've got to have a business checking account. Um, not a lot of traditional banks will entertain having a checking account for a crypto project. Um, I got denied from Wells Fargo because they're just not comfortable doing that. So um, th there are some options out there, but that was a surprise. Um, you've got to make sure that in, you know, any project that you're doing that you've got a good, um, you know, good contracts team, good lawyers, um, make sure that you've got, you know, your, your gas purchase agreement is in good shape. Um, another thing you've got to consider is if you're an operator, um, you may need to start paying royalties on gas that you were previously flaring that had nothing, you know, nothing in it for the landowner. So you've got to make sure you can, you know, do some sort of compensation for the landowner on the royalties of that. And also you've got to insure all your equipment. Um, the insurance business is, is slowly integrating with the concept of Bitcoin, but not all oil and gas insurance providers are going to be comfortable and confident in insuring crypto projects. So I've been working to try to educate them that it's no different than, you know, any other piece of equipment on an oil field. Um, except for, of course, it is very expensive. So those are a couple things to keep in mind. So really, as, as I'm looking into um, Bitcoin mining as an option for emissions reductions, you know, if if we're taking that gas and we're flaring it, it's literally, it's got no use, right? That gas is just being wasted. Now, according to the Global Gas Flaring Tracker Report, um, in 2020, about 142 billion cubic meters of upstream gas were flared globally last year, 2020. So if we were to take all of that gas and instead of flare it, we were to mine it instead, we could eliminate over 100 million metric tons of CO2 a year without using any additional sources of energy to do so. So I'm a big fan of using Bitcoin mining as a real way to create emissions reductions, criteria pollutants, as well as carbon reductions. Um, and I'm happy to see so many projects out there um, that are taking this off-grid flared gas to use. So in conclusion, um, Artemis Energy, we're looking for active uh, clients and projects who may want to move forward with Bitcoin mining, um, as well as forming some of those JVs we talked about. Um, Artemis is specifically only mining in spaces where we can make an emissions reduction. Also, I mentioned Bright Sky Environmental. That's my environmental consulting firm. And we're working on preparing air permits for a lot of Bitcoin miners in Texas and across the U.S. So thank you for joining me today. I'd love to hear your questions. I'll be here for the Q&A. You can also reach me at um, either of these two email addresses. I look forward to hearing from you, and I wish you good luck in your Bitcoin mining journey. Thank you.